Now today we'll begin at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Lord, we pray that you'll now speak to us through these powerful, wonderful words, the closing comments of the Apostle Paul, written through the anointing and inspiration of your Holy Spirit, for a purpose. May your purpose be worked in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Who do you suppose might have been the greater apostle? The apostle Peter or the apostle Paul? I guess it's easy to say, well, Peter was the greater apostle since he spent so much personal time with Jesus. He might have been the more uh, prominent one. Uh, Jesus did give Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Peter walked on water. Uh, Still, both apostles raised the dead, healed the sick, preached to convert sinners and started churches in that region, and both of them wrote parts of the New Testament. But when you think about it, it's really quite a silly debate, yet a debate that's been had out by many people through the centuries. I'm sure if both Peter and Paul were to chime in and give their opinion, they would both say, this is not about us at all. It's about Jesus. Leave us out of it. And uh, that's probably the better way to go. A silly argument indeed, but, but not a new one. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul said, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is arguing among you, my brothers, that each, of, each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And of course, we would answer, of course not. That would be the answer, and that's what Paul is saying here. Because what Paul wants is for us to build our faith and to rest our faith on Jesus and Jesus alone because there's no such thing as a super saint. They don't exist. The apostles were special, for sure. They had a special calling, called to a special time, and their contributions were special. But in reality, they were men. They were just men. And that's what I like about this closing section of 2 Timothy. It shows us a man. It's so real. It's it's so vulnerable. And it reveals really the, the manly or the human side of the Apostle Paul. And spirituality can never remove our humanness. We become spiritual, but we remain human. And sometimes we think that the more spiritual we become, well, the less human we become. But that's not the case at all. It couldn't be further from the truth. And here at the end of the apostle's life, we see a very human side. Timothy, I'm lonely. Timothy, I'm cold. Timothy, I'm I'm so disappointed. I'm so inadequate. I, I don't know. Can you just bring me some help? And can you come before winter, Timothy? Do you see it in there? It's, it's, it's so real, so human. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I know I have. I've felt alone in the work before. 
I felt a little bit too sick and even too tired to carry on with the work, with my calling, my ministry. I've certainly felt disappointment, disappointment in myself, but especially disappointment in others who have left me alone in the work, deserted me when I needed them. I've often felt very ill-equipped for the things that I'm called to do. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but if you have, then you're probably in pretty good company because that's how the Apostle Paul felt. And he felt that way, especially more so at the end of his road. Yet he pressed on anyway. He did what he had to do anyway. It makes me, reminds me of that 1939 classic film, The Wizard of Oz. You remember that old movie? That's a great old film if, you, if you've ever seen it. Remember that one line in there that's become so famous, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. But despite that, and if you know that scene, you know, they, had, they just found out they had to follow the yellow brick road and they thought, oh my, they're going to encounter all sorts of dangers. And, and so lions and tigers and bears, oh my. But despite their worries and their fears, they determined and they knew that they had to keep going. They had to keep moving. They had to follow the yellow brick road, fending off any and all dangers if Dorothy was going to make it home to Kansas again. They just had to keep going. Well, Paul had to deal with his own set of dangers and fears. Maybe they weren't lions and tigers and bears, but what we have in our text is lions and tyrants and betrayers. That's what he had to deal with. And he didn't mind telling Timothy about it. Let's talk about these things. In fact, that's what this section is all about and what the Christian life can sometimes feel like in our world. Remember, Paul the Apostle said in the book of Acts, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Lions and tyrants and betrayers, oh my, they were coming for sure. I may sound like a bit of exaggeration to you, and it mostly is for those of us who live here in the USA, and we don't really get to see a lot of that craziness, but it's probably because you're not deeply entrenched in the ministry as I am. Because I'll tell you, I've seen some lions and I've seen some tyrants and I've seen betrayers. I've seen them all. But in many parts of the world, it's, it's a dangerous thing to call yourself a Christian. I don't know if you heard, but just this weekend in Nigeria, there was a pastor in the pulpit preaching to his congregation when he was, they were attacked uh, by a gang of, of renegade Muslims. And they came into the church, they grabbed the pastor, grabbed the pastor's wife and daughter and macheted them, tied their feet together and then burned the building on fire while they were still alive. When the Christians came to collect the bodies, there were no bodies, there were just ashes in a pile in the middle of the room. This is because of their Christian faith. Now this is a terrible thing, I know. But it's very natural in a situation like that, very human, to have fear, to have anxiety, knowing that this is what we might expect along our journey. And the Apostle Paul had those anxieties. He had those fears. So in verse 9, he writes, Be diligent to come to me quickly. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Now he's obviously expressing some emotion here. It's almost as if he's sounding a bit scared, frightened. He's definitely sounding lonely and discouraged, wouldn't you say? Be diligent to come to me quickly, quickly. And why would he say that? Why would he talk like that? Because he knew that his time was rapidly coming to a close. This life was about to be over for him. Hurry up, Timothy, and get here, please. I have so much more that I want to say to you. I want to say it to you face to face, and I'd like to see you one last time. Or perhaps it was more of a, of a mindset of, I'm so scared, and I don't want to die alone. Just be here. I want to know you're with me. I'm sure we can all relate to that type of human emotion as we hear the apostle talk about it. I mean, think about it. In verse 10, he said, Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world, he's departed for Thessalonica. Demas, what are you doing? What have you done, Demas? Now, we don't know a lot about this Saint Demas, but we do know something. We know that he's mentioned three times in the New Testament, all by the Apostle Paul in Paul's writings. We first 
meet him in Paul's letter to Philemon, where Paul refers to Demas as one of his fellow laborers, a co-worker in the ministry. He was listed with very good people, Epaphras or Epaphroditus, Mark, Aristarchus, and of course the apostle himself. He was also listed and mentioned with Luke, the physician. All of these are solid kingdom fighters and and definite church workers and church planters. That's the first time we hear the name Demas. The next time we hear his name, it's mentioned in Colossians 4. Now, curiously, he's only named there. There's no mention of his service, no indication that he was active in the faith at all. He was just there. And then finally, he's mentioned here in a very negative light as Paul called him a deserter, having forsaken the ministry altogether. And and it's such a sad thing to see the undoing of useful men of God. You know, I see this quite often. People who are useful and no longer are useful. They've made a decision and they're no longer around. Now, you might not see what I see. You might not know what I know when I see things like that happen. And it breaks my heart to see it. There's so much disappointment, so much discouragement, so much ache and pain when you see someone make these wrong choices and turn away from the Lord. I wonder how many of of you here today can relate to Demas somewhat. You know, there are three phases to this life that we see in the Bible regarding Demas. There is the active phase, and I'm sure during that time of his life, he was was very active in his service for the Lord, dedicated to, to the work, committed to see things happen. It was an exciting time for him, no doubt, one that would have produced a lot of fruit from his efforts. And then there was this stagnant phase, it seems, in Colossians, where he, he appeared to be a little lazier than he did in the past. Once he was a co-worker, meaning he was a worker, and suddenly he's just there. And it seems he did less and watched more. And then there's that third phase. He just dropped out of the race completely. He's, he's ineffective, abandoned the work, abandoned his post. Why? What is it that happened? Well, Paul tells us in verse 10, having loved uh, this present world, he departed. He loved the world, and he departed. Now, that hurts. It hurts the testimony of, of Christ. It hurts the testimony of the church, the body of Christ. It hurts the testimony of the ministers and the ministry of the church. It just hurts. What were you thinking, Demas? Now, maybe he was afraid. We can give him that. Maybe he, he had some fears there, thinking about the dangers, the lions, the tyrants, the betrayers. All of this, was, it was hard for him, and he didn't want to face it. But to love this present world more than your calling, more than your ministry, more than your master, what were you thinking, Demas? What were you thinking? I don't get it. No wonder Paul was feeling so discouraged and and so alone. This was a very deep and very personal blow to the apostle. But not everyone left for the wrong reason. In verse 10, we hear the name of Cretans and Titus. It seems that they left to care for these churches that were in Galatia and Dalmatia. Dalmatia, by the way, is the region of Croatia today. And these were churches were started in these particular cities, and so it appears as if Paul let them go or dispatched them to that area. In verse 12, we read, And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. So it's it's practical or normal for us to think that that the apostle dispatched Cretans and Titus and Tychicus to these cities uh, as if they were the tips of the arrows in his quiver. Paul was in prison. He couldn't go visit these places. So look, Christians, you, you've gone over to Galatia. Make sure the saints are doing okay. Um, hey, Titus, you go over to Dalmatia. Check them out. But I don't want them to slip away like some of these others we've heard. And Tychicus, you go over to Ephesus. You go over there and you, you hang with the people there. Make sure they're strong. Keep, teach them the word. Preach the word. Don't let anyone come in and preach anything else. You preach the word. It's necessary. These are the tips of his spear. Necessary for the sake of the gospel, for the advancement of the gospel and of the church. 
And the show must go on, in other words. That's a good way of looking at it. Look, listen, I'm in prison, but hey, it's not about me. It's about this gospel. I mean, yes, it's, it's very natural for Paul as a human being to feel sorry for himself. But he really came to this conclusion, there is no time for me to be feeling sorry for myself. There's no time for that. And, and listen, this is what we've got to get through our heads. Stop with the pity parties. Life is, life is hard. Okay, get over it and move forward. Life is hard. You say, well, how dare you talk to me like that? Get over that too. Get over it. Listen, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. I know what it's like to have it hard. I know what it's like to lose someone very dear to you, very close to you. But there's no time in this kingdom work to sit around and lick our wounds. We have to keep moving. We must keep moving for Christ and not stop and say, poor me. It's not about me. It's not about you. And the sooner we get this, the better off we're going to be in the ministry. In verse 20, Paul said, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I left in Miletus sick. Now, don't you find that interesting? Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Why? Why did he leave him there sick? Why didn't he heal him before he left? He's an apostle. He could do stuff like that, right? He could have added him as another point in his quiver. He could have said, here's another one. Now, you go over to, to Germany or wherever you're going, but you just go and But no, he he said, I got to leave you, Trophimus. You're sick. Wait a minute. What do you mean you're sick? Paul should have healed him. But it tells us that even the apostle doesn't have the authority to use those gifts without the Lord's permission. The Lord is the only one with that kind of authority. This wasn't a lack of faith. It wasn't a lack of of Paul's faith or or Trophimus' faith. It was just simply a lack of God's will. Paul, no doubt, would have prayed for Trophimus. Let's lay hands on you. We'll pray for you. Maybe the Lord will heal you. And the Lord said, no. Paul, you move on without Trophimus. And that was the deal. Get used to it. That's going to happen in life. People are going to be sick. People are going to be injured. People are not going to be able to help you because they have their personal issues. They have personal problems. So what are you going to do? Well, I'll wait for you. No, you can't wait. You got to go. You got to get moving. Sometimes God says no. That's why Christians get sick. That's why we're not always healed in our, in our lives. Why Christians will die of disease and, and natural causes and accidents. It happens all the time. It's been happening for thousands of years and it's not going to stop. These are things we must get used to and determine that we'll keep pressing forward no matter what. Not only were there the lonelinesses and the uh, disappointments of the work, there there were the oppositions to the work. In verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Oh, may the Lord repay him according to his work. That's how I read it. I don't know how you read it. Maybe you see him sitting like this with a halo around his head. Not me. Oh, may the Lord repay you for what he did to me, you lousy scoundrel. That's the way I would think. Another thing we need to get used to, people who don't appreciate the gospel are not going to play nice. Listen, we have a world of people, we have a nation of people that don't like Jesus and don't like the gospel. That is not news. It's not newsworthy. It's been that way since Jesus set foot on the earth. He was barely two years old and they tried to kill him, remember? Remember? It's been that way. Horrible things happen against Christians. Live with it. Preach the gospel. What Alexander did to Paul, we're really not sure. We can imagine. We're told in verse 15, he has greatly resisted our words. So there were no doubt words exchanged, debates were had, arguments and accusations, even perhaps legal actions made against the Apostle Paul, cease and desist, stop preaching the name of Jesus, such things like that. In fact, some people believe that Alexander may have provided 
the false testimony against Paul, which actually may have led to his arrest in Troas. And that's why his cloak and his books were with Carpus there in Troas. We don't know a lot about Alexander or even who he was. We do know that Paul warned Timothy, you also must be aware of him. So whoever he was, wherever, whatever he did, he was still out there, he was still dangerous, and he was going to be gunning for Timothy. So Timothy, you beware of this guy. Watch out for him. He's mean. good thing is, is we have promises from the Lord that no, no weapon forged against you will prosper. The promise is that you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Isaiah said this, thus says the Lord in Isaiah 54. And he said, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. So if you're a servant of the Lord, this is good news for you. If you're not serving the Lord, there's no good news for you. And the Lord's advice is this, in Luke 12, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I'll tell you whom to fear, fear God, who has the power to kill you and throw you into hell. He's the one to fear. That's what Jesus said. Live for the Lord. That's the wise thing to do. Fear the afterlife. That's important. I hope Demas realized that and changed his mind. Now, it's one thing when bad people diss you or resist you and forsake you, but when your own Christian brothers do it, people within the church, well, well, there's a special kind of hurt that comes from that. And the Apostle Paul talked about that in verse 16. He said, at my defense, no one stood with me. All forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Where were all the Christians from Rome? Where were they? No one wanted to stand with the great Apostle Paul. I mean, they begged him to come to Rome. We want you to come there. Come on to Rome. We'll, we'll put you up. We'll take care of you. Come to Rome. But now they're nowhere to be found. He once wrote to the saints in Rome, Romans chapter 1. He said, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I often intended to come to you. So they were asking, come on, come on. I really wanted to come, but thus far I've been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I've been busy. I've been preaching the gospel. People are getting saved. I'm in the middle of a great harvest. I can't just cut off and go take a vacation in Rome as much as I'd like to. But you've got to know this. When I come to Rome, it won't be a vacation. I'm going to be doing some preaching. I'm going to be giving you the gospel. Well, where are they now? Well, we suspect, given this passage here that they are just simply too afraid to be identified with this Christian agitator, Paul. I mean, they knew the persecution against Christians was increasing, especially in the Roman region. Nero was building up to the great uh, accusation of Christians for burning down Rome. Rome hadn't been burned. Within the next 10 years or so, Rome will have been burned. So they were afraid. Christians were being fed to the lions already. They were getting their heads cut off. They were being ripped apart by horses. They were wrapped in burlap blankets, dipped in tar, only to be lit on fire and used to light the crazy Nero's gardens. What would you do? I don't know who Paul was. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I never attended one of those, what, what, what did you call it, um, Bible study? Yeah, no, no, I, I, never, I don't even know what that is. Never been to any of those. Which was very natural, very human. I mentioned the pastor and his family that were burned, but he was preaching in the pulpit. Where were the rest of the Christians? They ran, like any of us would. They ran. And so Paul, realizing their fears, prayed, may it not be charged against them. Here, he offers an understanding prayer, a compassionate prayer for these fearful saints. They might not have been brave enough to stand with Paul, but perhaps through his martyrdom, through his testimony, they would be encouraged, emboldened to stand for Christ one day in their own martyr. We don't 
need to stand with men, but we do need to stand with Christ. There were some honorable saints there. Paul mentioned two of them in particular. He says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. Faithful and dependable Luke. Dr. Luke, steady as a rock, kind, even legendary as Paul speaks about him in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the brother, he said, who is famous in all the churches for his service to the gospel. An ancient understanding of that as he was talking about Luke. Luke was given the very important task of writing the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. He's the author of both. Two incredible accounts, one of the life of Christ, the other of the life of the early church. And we thank God for Dr. Luke, for his ministry, for his life. And his life, of course, being so connected and linked to the Apostle Paul, even here in Paul's final hours, Dr. Luke is with him. And then we have Mark, also known as John Mark, or John, his name was actually John, but was called Mark, and so he's referred to quite often in Scripture, or at least in in writings of Scripture, as John Mark. And he's often credited with the authorship of the Gospel of Mark. He was, in his early days, a travel companion with the Apostle Paul, along with Barnabas, until Mark deserted them on the mission field. And Paul didn't take it too well. When Barnabas wanted to bring Mark along on another missionary journey, Paul protested, absolutely not over my dead body. That punk kid is not coming with us. No way. And so they had words. They had a heated argument. And the heavy-hitting team of Paul and Barnabas split up for good. And I'm sure at that time was more devastating than when the Beatles broke up over Yoko Ono. Huge. Anybody remember that? It nearly ruined my childhood. (laughs) But now the Apostle Paul said, get Mark, bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. Isn't that great? You know what that tells me? It means you don't have to remain Mark. You don't have to remain Demas. Stuff happens. Stuff happens all the time. People with different opinions are going to collide, and it's going to happen. Um, Let's see, shall I say it? Get used to it. It's human. It happens. Oh, I don't want to go to church. There's nothing but hypocrites there. Duh. That's why we're here. We're trying to get all that straight. That's why we come here. Trying to get ourselves fixed. That's the point of it. It's funny that you're judging us, though, you hypocrite. (laughs) Perhaps you've made a bad decision. Maybe you've made a mess of your life. Maybe you've made a mess of the ministry, and you feel so ashamed. But listen, you can still change. You can make it right and still be used by the Lord. Because God is a God of many chances. He's ready to give you another chance anytime you're ready. So don't get down on yourself and don't be discouraged and don't give up because there's room for you in God's service. Paul may have felt lonely and abandoned and discouraged, but but he chose a higher road here. He turned this whole thing into a training moment for Timothy and ultimately for us. In verse 16, he said, At my first defense, no one stood with me. All forsook me. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom to God. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. I I love the way Paul turned this whole thing around. It reminds me of of what King David did in Psalm 42. He was depressed. He was bummed out. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? He wrote, hope in God, for I shall yet again praise him for my salvation. That's what he did. He turned it around. He turned it around. Well, of course, it's natural that we're going to be discouraged 
Depression is, is, is common. It's, it's, it's going to be the natural reaction in difficult situations. Ah, I feel miserable. Why not so-and-so is talking bad about me? Or this guy did this to me, and ah, I lost someone I love. Oh, it, it hurts. Of course you're going to feel that way. That's why God gave us emotions. It's a way to express what we feel. This is what I feel right now. Let your emotions do what they're supposed to do, but don't let your emotions rule your spirit because your emotions do not control your spirit. They control your soul. It's totally different. And Paul rose above his emotions, and he turned this into a very spiritual word from the Lord, and he turned his thoughts toward the Lord in the midst of his deep sadness and discouragement as he reminded himself of his calling and of his purpose in this life, and, and he was determined that he, he was going to play that role, do his job until the very end. And as a result, he was able to deliver the good news of the gospel one more time, one more time. As he said in verse 17, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message what might be preached fully through me, <laughs> imagine that, my head is about to be taken off. But before you whack off my head, let me use my mouth just one more time for the glory of Jesus Christ. How many of us think that way? How many of us think of preaching to others in the midst of our depression or our lousy feeling? I don't, I don't think that way. I don't think that way at all. I, I should, but I don't. And I think that's the point that I, I'm trying to make here, a point that I think Paul is making. And then listen, this, this life is really not about us anymore. It's not about us anymore. We try to make it about us because that's the natural human thing to do. But when we're spiritual, it's not about us, it's about Jesus. That's why he says, to him be the glory forever and ever. In my dying day, in my dying moment, to God be the glory. And we have to fight, don't we, in our flesh to keep our flesh down, to keep it away from ourselves and not touch that glory. But sometimes the fight, if we realize, is really inside of me. It's not with the people out there trying to give me a rotten day. No, it's within me, my emotions, my mood swings. Paul realized, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion probably speaking of Nero, though it was a temporary deliverance because Nero finally got him. But his conclusion was the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. Now, Paul, 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 isn't that just wishful thinking? You got your head whacked off. You died. Yeah, but he wins. This is the confidence that we have as Christians. There isn't anything that we need to fear because we always win when we are in the service of Jesus Christ. Yeah, but you died. Yeah, what happens when you die? You go to heaven. Well, wait a minute. Do you really believe that? Jesus talking to Mary and Martha, remember? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though you may die, yet you shall live. Do you believe that? That's what, she, that's what he said to her. Do you believe it? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Do you really believe that? Because it changes everything. It changes everything. Listen, listen. If heaven and hell are real, then that's the only thing that matters. If heaven and hell are not real, then nothing matters. Nothing matters. If these things are real, if Jesus is real, oh my goodness. That's what Paul is saying. My life is not my own. That was his philosophy. I've been blood bought. I've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. My life doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to Jesus, and that has to be our philosophy too. And finally, Paul sends a personal and even a heartfelt plea to Timothy do your utmost to come before winter. Of course, we don't know if Paul made it through the winter or to the winter even, or if Nero took his head off before that. We don't know if Paul ever saw Timothy again. But we are able to grab a bit of a sneak peek into the personal thoughts and emotions of a man of God who was about to die. Time 
was running out for him, of course, but if you think about it, time is running out for all of us. Saved or not, the clock is ticking. The growth, the harvest, all stop in winter. That's the idea. So do your utmost to do your job for Christ before winter comes. And the time is a funny thing. It's, it, it's something we don't think much about when we're young. I could tell you I think a lot more about it these days. I think a lot about my younger days and what I shouldn't have done to make my older days a lot harder. Like, you know, the sports I played, the things I did, my knees hurt, and everything else. And I think, boy, I wish I wouldn't have played that sport. We can't replace time. And it's always slipping away. Right? And that we know that it's slipping away. We, we say it all the time. Where'd the time go? We, we see our kids graduate from high school and we think, where'd the time go? I remember when I just took them home from the hospital as a baby. Where'd the time go? We walk our daughter down the aisle, but <laughs> where'd the time go? Where did it go? So fast. It goes by so quickly, but when we're young, we don't even think about that. We cannot replace time. It's constantly ticking away. So the lesson for today, if I may leave you with this, live for Jesus now, now, now. If you're not a Christian, give your life to Jesus before winter. Because there's no harvest in winter. Give your life to Jesus before it's too late. Uh, stop pretending. Start, stop pretending you're smarter than God. You're not. Give, give up that fight. Give it up. Stop it. It's funny. You're not smarter than God. So give it up and give your life to him. And do so quickly because winter's coming. Let's pray. Lord, hear our prayer and hear our hearts cry to you. Oh, how we need you, Lord. We need you to bring ourselves in check. We try so hard to make this life about ourselves. But in the Christian life, it's not that way. It's got to remain about you even to death, to the very end. Let it be about you. Always make it about you, Lord. Help us to see the value of that, the importance of it. Make that life of devotion to you be attractive to the people of this world who don't know you yet. May they want you because of what they see living in our lives. May we give our lives to you so fully, so devoutly, so wholly. Please, Lord, take us now. If you're not a Christian today, pray this prayer with me, if prayer of belief, and just simply say, I believe, Lord, I believe. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for, for fighting you, but I believe. I believe in you right now, and I give you my life. I'm sorry for the way I've been. From this day forward, help me to learn about you. Help me to want to be like you. Teach me what's right, what's wrong, and what makes you pleased, and what makes you displeased. And from this day forward, I want to live for you. I want to run for you. I want to work for you. I want to fight for you. All my life is yours now. In Jesus' name I pray.